Welcome to Two Gals in a Glass Half Full. We are Dr. Bobby and Dr. Jess, two physical therapists just doing our best to lead healthy lives most of the time because moderation is key. We like to see our glasses as half full. Some days is much harder than others and hope to share that perspective with all of you. We love learning from others, so we like to interview others more knowledgeable than us so they can teach us all of their perspectives. This month, we are talking about breast cancer, and I'm very excited about our special guest today. But first, before we get started, Dr. Jess, what is in your glass? Well, today I've got this uh, kombucha. I'm, I'm uh, trying to stay hydrated in different ways. So I've already had my smoothie, my coffee, a uh, bottle of water, and so now I'm on to kombucha. And so this one has probiotics in it, and it's mango flavored. So anyway, that's what that's, that's what's on the market one. today, right? Uh, Dr. Bobby, what's in your glass? I just have good H2O, just plain old water. Had my coffee this morning, so on to water. Perfect. So with us today, we have a guest. Her name is Brooke Cribs. And so Brooke, first, what's in your glass? Water. (laughs) (laughs) I do, I've already had my coffee. I'm now on my big old glass of water. (laughs) Perfect. So Brooke, tell us a little bit about you. So um, my name is Brooke Cribs. I'm living currently in a right outside of Charleston, South Carolina. I am a DIY blogger by day, (laughs) mom (laughs) by night, actually all the time. Um, And yeah, that's just basically what I do. I write about and do DIY projects and uh, helping people, as my tagline says, tackle the chaos of life, one DIY and organizing project at a time. I love that. (laughs) I love it. And I love your work. I love like watching it or seeing it. It's so cool. Um, you Thank think you. of things I couldn't even imagine doing. So it's very neat. <laughs> and for anybody so. that wants more information after the after the episode about Brooke and follow her DIY information, uh, everything's right. going to be tagged in the episode description. So yep. never feel like you won't be able to know more about like all these cool <laughs> things. <that we're> <laughs> it's really all cool. the projects. All, all the projects. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so Brooke, yeah, would you be willing to sh- Yeah. I'll say I'm currently working on my biggest DIY project yet. Me. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Most important one too, right? Absolutely. So would you be willing to share with us a little bit about your experience with breast cancer and how it has affected you and your family? Absolutely. Um, so uh, back in 2019, um, <laughs> um, my mom we found out she had breast cancer and unfortunately she only had three weeks from time of diagnosis to the time she passed. So that freaked me out. I'm an only child and my father had passed away in 2012 also from cancer, a different type of cancer. And I just, with the breast cancer, um, and the fact that she only had a three week illness basically, my husband, who's a physician assistant, was able to get me on to one of the um, one of the most known breast surgeons in the area, who actually is in his hospital. And so we sat down and we talked about my mom and what had happened with her, and we talked about risk assessment and what my future would hold, since um, we felt like it just came out of nowhere, even though we know cancer just typically doesn't come out of nowhere. She probably mm-hmm. had it for a very long time, but right. just the symptoms didn't present themselves until it was way too late. Mm-hmm. So she wanted to run a series of genetic testing on me just to kind of ease my mind and, and see what those next steps were going to be for me. Um, also, I have two teenage daughters and I was concerned for them as well. Mm-hmm. So she recommended that I do genetic testing I was fully prepared that if it came back with the well-known BRCA1 and BRCA2, a prophylactic double mastectomy, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I had told my husband, like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what it comes back. But the curveball came back that it was check two, which isn't one of the more widely known gene mutations for breast cancer, but it is definitely one of the up and comings. Um, the CHAC2 gene mutation also carries a risk for colorectal, um, cervical, thyroid, skin, and lung cancers. So it started me on this train of the next step was then a colonoscopy. 
So kind of just to give you guys a timeline as far as for me personally. So mm-hmm. I turned 40 in October of 2018 wow. and had very first mammogram in October, mm-hmm. as cliche as it may sound, um, I had it done then. And my mom passed away in April of 2019. So I hadn't even been a year since my first mammogram. Mm-hmm. And already we were talking colonoscopy. So I had the colonoscopy, everything like fine. He recommended that I come back every five years just, you know, to be mm-hmm. on the safe side. Mm-hmm. And then my breast doctor recommended that I consider a double mastectomy. But at the time, because of how quickly everything had happened with my mom, handling her estate, I'm an only child. She lived in Ohio. I live in South Carolina. I felt like it was too much for me to process because I wasn't prepared for any other gene mutations. I was only prepared for the BRCA1 and BRCA2. Right. Uh, so she recommended that I just do a, the every six months mammogram um, MRI. So I did that for about three years and just my anxiety every six months of wondering, is this going to be the time where something comes back? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I did have a spot that came up suspicious. Uh, so that pretty much did it for me. And I made the decision. It ended up being benign. But I ended up doing the, making the decision that a prophylactic double mastectomy was just the way to go mm. for me personally. Right. So yeah. um, by genetic, so the doctor sits down, it's, you know, it's a blood draw. And mm. um, she sits down and we talk about risk as far as my percentage. She said the normal woman can have anywhere from 10 to 12% average risk of getting breast cancer just because of just everyday risks, right? Um, environmental or whatever the case may be. My risk was um, just at 30%. So more than a normal woman without a history of breast cancer, but still elevated nonetheless. Mm-hmm. And um, she said, if I had the double mastectomy, it would bring it to below 5%. Mm-hmm. So that I felt like was a no brainer to me to mm-hmm. go ahead and have the surgery. For sure. And so I think what's what's helpful with this conversation is that it's not this easy, like, oh, I have some gene mutation, therefore, boom, I get this, this double mastectomy. There's so many more influencing factors that go into that decision. And it's not there's not a right or wrong decision, you know, is really the situation. It's, you just have to make the decision based on what's in front of you with the information you have. So it's like, this is your risk. So is it for sure? No, you know, your risk is higher than the norm. However, this does exist to help decrease the risk. So, you know, um, as far as the, the surgery itself, Um, how, like, how was your experience with, with that recovery? So the big thing, cause my husband, like I said, he's a physician assistant. His biggest concern was the actual surgery because it's a seven, it was a seven hour surgery for me. So being under anesthesia, you know, having surgery in general, there's a risk Absolutely, being under anesthesia for that long of time. Mm-hmm. is a huge risk. Right. Um, and he was really concerned about that. So I brought him in to talk to the doctor so that they could talk doctor terms. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and it could kind yeah. of ease his fears and concerns. And he walked away feeling much better about that. Um, so the day of surgery, I uh, went in and there was an option of, I would either go direct to implant. That mm-hmm. was my plan. Um, or end up with expanders, which ultimately is what I ended up getting. And I'm grateful for, um, for a number of reasons. One, I didn't realize that I was lopsided. (laughs) And so the expanders gave my skin a chance to heal and they can make some modifications without me having like a breast lift, um, or any of those types of things. Um, I, I opted for nipple sparing. Mm -hmm. Some people don't, um, some people don't even uh, they, they offer, there's all different kinds. There's, you know, the Goldilocks, there's the DIEP flat procedure. Um, so there's several different procedures that you would go through before you even have the surgery. Mm-hmm. I opted for, uh, nipple sparing over the muscle. So everything is going to be on top of the muscle and, um, 
and I did get, end up with the expanders first. And then mm -hmm. for the weeks after that, I went in and they did um, saline where they would implant or in, inflate the expanders with the saline. And so they got it to a point where they felt like it would hold place with based on my skin for mm -hmm. the next surgery, mm -hmm. which would be the exchange surgery. Mm -hmm. um, but not everybody goes the implant route and that's totally fine. There's um, a lot of concerns about implant illness and um, that sort of thing. Some women go flat, which is perfectly fine as well. You have to do what's best for you and what you mm -hmm. are going to be happy with um, as well as not everybody does nipple sparing. Some remove their nipples, which again, it's personal preference. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think if you do the, uh, remove the nipple, there's, uh, like tattoo artists that yes. will tattoo the nipple on and it's like a, it looks three dimensional. So you would never even, um, you would never know that like, wow. yeah, it, it's just like, wow. if you want the look, you know, yeah. um, yeah, that, and I've that, even, that's an option. Yeah. I've even seen some women, um, go to a tattoo artist, not even do the nipples and just have flowers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are oh, so many amazing and beautiful options out there. Yeah. Um, you can get the silicone. Um, they're like, like almost like, um, they look like nipples. They feel like a nipple would feel, but they mm -hmm. stick on with a special adhesive. If you wanted to go that route too, and you mm -hmm. didn't want to do two. So yeah. the, the, the options are endless basically. As far as what Absolutely. you can do for the reconstruction part of it. Yeah. I think, uh, I think a good thing that you brought up though, as well is that if you do the double mastectomy and you choose that route to decrease your risk, that, uh, even if you don't do re reconstruction, right. Yeah, um, absolutely. it's, it's whatever is your personal choice is the right choice is I right. think is the biggest thing. There's, there's nothing in either direction that would be right or wrong. It's, no. It doesn't matter what society tells us how we should look. It's when we look in the mirror what makes us feel good? Right. And, and how do I, I'm like, yes, I feel good about this choice, about this decision. And, and that's what's important. You know, um, I work with patients that, that don't do reconstruction. I work with patients that do reconstruction that do deep flap versus under the muscle versus lat flap. Um, every single circumstance is different. Some right. do tattoos, mm -hmm. some don't. Some do nipple sparing, some don't. Right. And it's really such an individual choice and decision that it's between you, your provider, your family, anybody that you include in that inner circle to help you, you know, with such a huge choice is is what it is. Um, right. It's not right or wrong. There no. it really isn't. Yeah. No. So, and I highly recommend. So, I joined two Facebook groups, um, their support groups. One I joined mm -hmm. for the check two and the other one is there's a prophylactic mastectomy group. Mm -hmm. Um, there's actually several groups on there. So I highly recommend that if you ever find yourself in the situation that you do find your people mm -hmm. once so you can ask questions, um, and get people's opinions. I mean, we have people all the time, every day that come into the, the mastectomy group and they're like, what do I do? Like, they're just, I've got this information and I don't know what to do with it. And then that's where we swoop in and we're like, this is what I did. And this is why. And it's a very, it's a safe space. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Cause unfortunately it's one of those things that until you've actually gone through it or you're considering it, do you even know what all is out there? Because it doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not something that everybody, um, it's not something that everybody experiences right. and having that, support group to fall back on has helped me in my journey as far as healing and ask the questions and get the real raw honest truth aside from like the medical perspective of course you always mm -hmm. recommend going yeah. back and, and talking to your provider but yeah. those real life like these drains are awful are they <laughs> you're supposed to feel this way um are the implants going to be better than these expanders you know when can I sleep on my stomach? You know, the, the real questions that people mm -hmm. have once they've right. gone through this sort of, sort of situation. Yeah. And I so, think everyone's different there, right? Like right. some people, it, they fly through the recovery. Other people might have some complications that come up, which is like any surgery could have some complications. And so you oh, just yeah. deal with those and, you know, it just, you just keep making the best decision with you can that you can with the information you have currently. Like there's no hindsight is 2020. Um, that, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It's, 
do I feel good about this choice? Does it seem like it's going to push me forward and in, into the direction that I'd like to go for myself, my family, whatever, what it might be. And, and then, yeah, get as much support as you possibly can. Yeah, right. So speaking of family, Brooke, I know you have two beautiful teenage girls. How, um, how much of the, this whole journey have you shared with them? Have they learned, you know, like how have you used it for education with them? And just kind of um, teaching them. Yeah. So they, we're a very open family. We talk about everything um, to the point where I feel like sometimes they feel like they're a part, they're, they're adults and they have a say in a lot of stuff. <laughs> but at the same time, I felt like they're 14 and 15. So mm-hmm. obviously, and, and I had my surgery the first week of summer break. I'm not, I'm not awesome. Mom, <laughs> but I also had to worry about, you know, my daughter went to a high school where I had to drive her. And I wasn't going to be able to drive for the first couple of weeks. So I needed to, to set my surgery based around her schedule as well. Um, but yeah, I was very open with them about this decision. Of course, after I'd already gotten all the information I needed and I mm-hmm. laid it out to them and said, this is what I'm going to do. And this is why I'm going to do it. And they have been very, very supportive and very helpful through all of this. And that's the other thing, you know, when we have the group, the people in the group, you know, we've got women who have young kids and they're, they're like, what do we, how do I break this down to them? Do I even talk to them about this sort of thing? But with the girls, I also worry about their future yeah. and um, guiding them through their medical journeys and telling them they don't necessarily have to do what I did. This is a very personal choice. I would support them either way. Um, they may not even have the gene that I have. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I don't want them to be scared because I'm not scared. Um, I just want them to be informed more than anything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, had my mom not had this happen to her, I never would have known that I had this gene. And then I probably may have ended up in the same situation. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that to my girls. So. Yeah. And that's the cool thing with the advancing science is that now there is testing available. And so right. is it that every single person needs to go get tested for any gene that exists? No, right. um, there's, <laughs> there's, tons of, uh, there's tons of different genes out there. Uh, if there is a family history of a specific condition and you can get tested and you choose to want that information so that you can right. do something with it, then great. Um, some people are like, listen, I don't wanna know. Like I'm not gonna, I wouldn't do it anyway. And so that's okay too, right? So, you know, do your screenings just like, you know, as recommended uh, programs and, um, you know, and and then go that route. Um, There's no, (laughs) there isn't a right or wrong. Um, You know, everything is really still imperfect when it comes to understanding human physiology and full prevention of anything bad that can happen is the real, is the real truth. Um, We're, we're getting better at it though there's more proactive testing that can be done. And I think that's, what's helpful about this episode is that we don't always have to wait until something happens. Like there, that is a thing that, that can be, you know, risk assessments can be done. Um, And the risk assessment, typically the provider just asks you questions and they're saying, okay, like, does anybody in your family have, have they had breast cancer? Yes who, and then you start like giving them all of the different names. If there's more than one person and then they'll ask like, at what age, you know, did they survive? Did they not, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and they, there's this little algorithm that they can fill in based on your family's history. And then that can also help to determine whether or not early mammograms could be something that's helpful. So, um, so yeah, in my family, I I didn't test positive for anything uh, genetically, but my risk assessment, because breast cancer is throughout my family, um, all postmenopausal, not premenopausal. And uh, so it was like, you should start mammograms at 35 and not 40. So I was like, fine, no problem. Now, the real thing here is that your insurance doesn't necessarily pay for that. (laughs) So it's, there's some of this also gets into payment issues. And so having to um, navigate that world was, was interesting for me personally. Right. I was like, what do you mean? It's denied. Like it's my risk assessment (laughs) says I should do this at 35. Why would you deny it? They're like, well, the rule is X like it's, it's just 
black line, 40 and above we pay, under 40 we don't. So something good to know for people out there is if you find an outpatient center that does mammograms and MRIs, check for what their cash pay rate is. It is quite affordable typically. So what is billed to your insurance typically is significantly less if you do a cash pay rate. And so all things that you can figure out and maybe not do it the hard way like I did, which was fighting my insurance for months on end to, to no avail, um, letters of medical necessity, all that kind of stuff for my provider to no avail. Um, and that was just my insurance in particular. Um, so other people's might. And then, um, but those are other things you can do. Just early screenings sometimes are recommended. You know, six months mammogram, six months MRI, going back and forth. Um, but yeah, the, the ask for cash pay, uh, the cash pay rate. Um, it, it really isn't bad at all, at least here in Jacksonville. You know, at an outpatient center, not hospital-based. Mm -hmm. If you go to a hospital-based testing center, they're typically much, much more expensive. Um, but go where you feel comfortable. Just if you're looking for just preventative, you just want some tests. Um, <laughs> there's ways to do it in, in a way that is it won't break the bank. So. Right. Well, and ironically, um, when my doctor recommended the genetic testing, my insurance tried to deny it at first. After mm -hmm. And the results back. So I had to go through the appeal process and say, listen, I had the genetic testing done and it proved that I had it. Why would you say that it wasn't necessary when both my parents had passed away from cancer? Right. Um, and they did end up overturning their denial. Mm -hmm. um, and even with the um, actual mastectomy itself, um, I, and most of the time it can be, but I got really lucky. Mine was hundred percent covered by insurance outside mm -hmm. of my copay. Yeah. But there's people that still run the risk and have had in my group where they've been denied by insurance. So right. definitely knowing and understanding, understanding your insurance is huge in this situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And calling, calling your insurance and asking like what, you know, like as, as it is your policy, like you and that insurance company have this relationship. And so understanding that, not leaving it to the hands of just like, oh, well, it was denied, therefore it won't get paid. So I'll just pay it. Well, there's, there's extra documentation and supporting documentation that can happen to contest a denial. And so, mm -hmm. and sometimes that just takes time and energy and perseverance. Um, and it may work in your case. I'm really glad it did. And, and your positive test probably mm -hmm. is yeah. what then allowed <laughs> it to be right. paid, which exactly. they didn't want to pay for in the first place, but like right. in the long run, it's way cheaper to pay for a test a surgery with reconstruction than a cancer diagnosis. Right. right? So like yeah. it, that's why I always like try and talk to them. I'm like, don't you understand? Like, yeah. I'm, trying I'm trying to, to money. save you money. <laughs> right. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to save you uh, money and all the side effects that come with taking chemotherapy and other radiations and things like that, as well as future surgeries that you may have to have. So I think, you know, knowledge is power. So if yes. you have the information, you can be proactive about things. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about, you know, diet and exercise, obviously, um, making sure that you're taking the right supplements if you need to take supplements, um, avoiding certain things that could be potential triggers. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that goes into it, but it has to be buy-in from you and as well as the information you get from your provider. Um for me, it just meant more like, I don't, I don't want to wait until I have a cancer diagnosis to have to go through this anyway. Right. I would much mm -hmm. rather have this done, be able to put it behind me and then hopefully focus on the other things that I need to worry about, like getting my colonoscopies and going to my endocrinologist, which I have now set up for my thyroid and, mm -hmm. and all those other things to kind of like, just stay on top of it and be proactive. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, you are post surgery now. How yeah. are you feeling? One, physically, but two, um, I remember Jess had said something when we were talking about breast cancer. Is, um, you know, if you lose like a limb or something, it's something everyone can see. But like, you know, breasts are different. And so, how are you feeling, both physically and mentally, with like everything that you've been through and going through? Um, right now, I feel fine. Um expanders are just weird. They're just, I, I healed. Okay. I healed fine. Mm -hmm. They just, I, I call them SpongeBob square boobs just because they're just misshapen <laughs> and just 
not the prettiest things right now. It's okay. Um, I will say like when I woke up out of surgery and the first thing I did, I just had this sense of peace. And I, I can't explain it. It was just one of those, you know, one waking up out of surgery. <laughs> Mm-hmm. that's the big yeah. thing because you know that was, it was the fear of the unknown yeah I yeah. woke up I mean it was just yeah. the fear of the unknown and the fact that it was such a long it felt like five minutes for me mm-hmm. but um to be able to be at this point feels like forever ago when I had the surgery um I definitely feel ready for the next phase of it. I'm ready to have the final reconstructive surgery. Hopefully it's the final one. Um, hopefully everything goes okay and I heal okay. And then I can focus on just healing my overall body. Mm-hmm. I, and I did get a lot of questions and I do get a lot of questions. I have people, cause I do share my journey on my blog because I feel like this is just as much important as showing somebody an organizing project. Um, Mm -hmm. and I had somebody ask me, I thought you said you had a double mastectomy. You look like you have breasts. And I said, well, I do, but they're not real, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So, and then I understood at that point that there's this level of education that people just don't know. And it's not anything bad. It's just, they've never been given the opportunity to ask the questions. And so Mm -hmm. I'm just using my situation as a way to educate people that just because, you physically may see something that in your mind, you're like, well, you have breasts. So did you really have a mastectomy and understanding that there's so many different ways to do something. And, you know, I'm more than happy to share that part of it because education is power. Education Mm -hmm. is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just wanted to take away the stigma of whenever anybody thinks of a mastectomy, it's, you know, not everybody goes flat. Some people do, and that's fine. Um, mm-hmm. But there, there can be a reconstruction part of it where you can essentially go back to a different normal, mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. you're comfortable with. So right now, the holding pattern period of it is mentally, it's hard because I feel like I can't really get into a lot of things because I'm, there's that period of time between when I had surgery and when I was released back to activities to feeling good enough to be able to do things. Um, And now I'm getting ready to have the next surgery again. I'm going to have again another six weeks after the surgery where I'm going to be limited on what I can do. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm just like looking to the end of the year and even just next year to just really focus Mm -hmm. on whole healing um, Mm -hmm. mentally and physically. Well, and I thank you for sharing your story. I follow you. And most of what I know, because I don't experience a lot of um, breast cancer and like the reconstruction and the surgery part. Um, So kind of what I know is what I've learned through you and you sharing your experience. And I appreciate that. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's helpful to just make these conversations out in the open and real. So people don't feel like they have to hide in the dark and, and think that there's a right or a wrong answer that they're going to be judged in some way, um, going through a reconstruction. I mean, it's, it some, you know, sometimes there can be like, oh, well, you know, she just wanted implants or this or that. And there can be a little bit of like, um, judgment based on that. And it's like, right. So if someone got a total knee replacement, they had something inserted into their body. We don't judge them for that, do we? And so why, like, that's, that's not their, their knee that they were born with. So there's, there's zero reason to judge somebody for their personal choice, um, at all. It's, it's pretty simple. And so, um, if, if you're feeling like it's a judgment issue, then, um, that tells you more about the individual that's judging you than yourself. And so just stay true to you and what, how you feel about moving forward. And if you have peace about the decision and and then the people in your life that are truly in that inner support group that are safe for you are on board, then it's probably the right choice. Even if it's a lot of work. I mean, it is not like a double mastectomy is not a simple decision. 
I mean, think about everything you've been through surgery and then, and then this, um, the silicone, right. To like, um, expanders rather. And, and then to get the implants. I mean, this is a, this is a trudge to get through yeah. it. It is not this, like, Oh, I just, you know, boom, I just decided that, you know, I would go <laughs> through this and, you know, yeah. like five days later, I'm fine. This is like a long journey. And so yeah. it's, it really needs to be thought through and respected. I mean, like, that's huge. You, you have done a ton to make sure that you're going to hopefully be there as long as possible for your family. Right. And exactly. So you sacrificed a lot to do that. Um, mm-hmm. So I commend that. I think it's great um, because that was your, that was your choice. Um, right. You've worked hard for that choice mm-hmm. for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it definitely wasn't something that I ever would have imagined that I would be making no. for myself. I mean, no. nobody, nobody dreams of that. I mean, no. You yeah, don't that's want to not like a fun one. one. No, no. Like nobody wants to have to make that girl, choice. You're like, oh, I can't wait to get my breasts, <laughs> and then it's like, <laughs> you want me to cut my breasts off? Yeah. What are you talking about? Right. And, yeah. You know, that's a it's a huge decision. I mean, it's and and to, to know the commitment of it. I mean, it wasn't just the day of surgery. I mean, it was for the next two months after going in for weekly visits to the surgeon to have fills to watch mm-hmm. your incisions to have your drains removed and and all that went with that so yeah, yeah it definitely it definitely was the process that's for sure yeah. um and technically I mean I've really only been I want to say within the last four weeks a hundred percent back to normal mm-hmm. and the new norm so mm-hmm. this is even a new area for me too so for sure yeah we're just constantly learning and growing, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, Brooke, we very, very much appreciate you coming on. Um, I think this is like super brave. Thank you so much for sharing. And like I said um, earlier in the podcast, we're going to be sharing her information in the episode description. So if there's anything that you might want to learn and continue to learn from Brooke, uh, then please, please do uh, follow what, what she's posting and follow her journey. So anybody that would like to follow two gals. Uh, we now have a website that's up. And so you can uh, uh, more easily see our podcast and the kind of search through the ones that are that are there. Uh, we have, um, you know, we're on Facebook, we're on uh, Instagram. Uh, maybe we'll be on TikTok soon. We're still working on that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that one, but definitely follow us. And uh, hopefully some of the information we put out there is meaningful to you. Um, don't forget to click subscribe. That way it'll show up in your newsfeed. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.